All right, we're back. All right, so we're going over some stuff I did. What else was I doing on this motor? The rock arms already. Uh, oh, flywheel. So the flywheel's got a lot of lead added to it, which makes it really heavy. So this crank weighs about what a big twin does. It's heavy. It uses one rod because it has one cylinder. I used to use the female rod until it broke. I use the SNS Supreme rod, which probably don't make anymore because it's a racing part. SNS doesn't like racing anymore. So anyway, the the stock Harley rod I ran for about eight years, nine years. And I said I better get that out before it breaks. So I put the uh, I upgraded the SNS and it broke a year and a half later. So I took that out. That's why my motor locked up at 100. And, 35 mile an hour took out that bearing over there <laughs> so after that I took the uh, other rod because I had two two rods so I used the other rod and I went down to one bearing and I made spaces up in here to take up the slack so the motor doesn't know I only have one rod in there as far as it knows it's seeing two I run them nice and loose hear the up and down nice and loose so, something I've learned after a few years of racing is that if you want your rod bearings to spin and not slide at high RPM, you better loosen these rods up. So, I run anywhere from two and a half to three and a half thou clearance, depending on what mood I'm in. And the bearings roll and don't skid and tear up the crank pin. Also, I don't use a Jim's crank pin anymore because they only lasted three miles. They said, well, they're not any good. That's why you can't run them in racing. <laughs> so I switched over to Excel pins, which I've never worn this one out yet. And I have a, I have about 20 of them, so if I ever do wear it out, I got extras. So Excel used to make those about 20 years ago. They were making pins. They made them out of a Timken bearing steel. So the same material these bearings are made out of is what these crank pins are made out of. So they don't wear they're really good. So I like using those. So they hold up pretty nicely. Said I've never used, never wore this one out yet. The rods get out around because of the RPM I run, but I just hold them back around and I go from standard bearings to one over bearings and you hold them around twice and you take it apart and put a new race in to start over. And you only get to, you know, anywhere from 10 to 50 miles to a, to a rebuild. On the crank. This one's been together for a while, but I don't know how many miles are actually on it. I think I've got four runs on this crank. <laughs> don't remember. Not many. So I'll run a uh, Bonneville that goes three miles in a run, and El Mirage you go 1.3 miles. So this is all El Mirage runs. So, so I've got less than 10 miles on this crank. And same on the motor. The motor's probably only got five or six miles on it. Sorry, you part again. So, anyway, this part here looks good. I'll check to make sure it's uh, still halfway true. It gets knocked out of true. I don't care. The crank can flop around all at once. At, after Bonneville, it goes, it gets about, it's 12 to 15 thou out of true after a week of racing at Bonneville. That's equivalent of about 50 miles. The max, probably more like 20. But depends how many runs you get in. But the... That's basically uh, years, of years of street miles in a week. <laughs> so I run these really loose on this side so it, 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 um, it's free to ro rotate in the case or flop around. And that way it doesn't take out the case. The case is not going to keep the crank true, so make sure the bearings can float in there. Obviously this other side, this one floats over here, so that's not a problem. So that's how I did that. So this is a stock shaft here that I turned down in order to put the bearing on it. Because you go from American size down to metric. And you can see how the bearing spins on the shaft here. It spins on the inside of that one. So that's how that works. So that's all part of how you do that. This here is the uh, stroker plate that goes underneath the cylinder here. To compensate for the one inch increase in stroke length, I put a half inch thick plate in there. And I use the same piston. Right now I'm using a stock, every old day, Weisco piston. 
It's uh, whoa. It's high silicon, which is bad, they say, for racing, but I like them. So, on nitrous oxide, I can't run these anymore, but on nitromethane, like I'm using right now, I'm running 60% nitro on the motor. These things to be holding up. So, it tried to stick a little bit, and then it uh, hasn't done any more than that. It's got some heat in the top, a little bit on the bottom. This one here, I think, has got three runs on it. That's a miracle. <laughs> Looks like a valve was hitting on a little bit. Did I say I run my clearances close? Yeah, I run close. <laughs> the valves are supposed to hit the piston, so you know you got maximum valve lift. So that's how that is. These are my motor mounts I use. I made up my own mounts. So these go here like a stock mount through here, but I have a big bolt right there. That big bolt right there is my motor mount. It's all tied in the frame underneath, so it doesn't go anywhere. And then a stock mount in the back. So makes it a little bit easier to take it apart, plus it gives me room for my oil pan. Which is right here. So otherwise known as a skid plate. So I cut that up piece of 30 pound chunk of solid aluminum. It's this thick right here. This is quarter inch thick down there, so just like this is quarter inch thick in here. Actually, that's a bit thicker. It's probably three is thick through here. Didn't want to bust through. <laughs> so that goes all the way in the back. I put a trap door in here so I can clean it if I want to out the back. I've never done that yet. I've uh, this is the second generation of what I've done in here, but basically right now I got a big fitting that comes in here. It's a dash eight hose, and that goes into an electric. Holy fuel pump and it sucks the oil from here down here out the back way in the back out of there So under acceleration the oil is back here And the oil cannot come back up to here until you fill this void up in here So that's I don't have to worry about oil building up plus the uh, The crank only gets down to where my screen is here So I got a gap like that there plus I got all this height here. So I got a lot of room for oil I also have a lot of room for air volume so when the piston's going up and down, my crankcase pressure is not changing that much. The other thing I did was I opened the flywheels up in between here a little bit as best I could. This particular set's not opened up very much. My 500 set was opened up a lot. It was about this wide. You can put your thumb through here easy. So you want the air to be able to go down through the flywheel without hitting anything. It's another reason why it's got a lot of lead in there. It makes it smoother. I've also tapered stuff in there and Got really sharp edges so the air can flow through here into your pan and out of the motor. That's if the engine breather doesn't get it. The engine breather comes off the cam cover right here. See the size of that one. A little bigger than the stock 3 ace hose. That's a 3 quarter hose, I think, or 5 ace. <clears throat> so there's my breather right there on top of the tank. Everything breathes into the tank. And a bunch of oil lines over here. I don't see my fuel pump. It's buried under here somewhere. Yeah, it's in the box. You'll see it when I put the bike back together. This is my top motor mount. It doesn't move. Goes into that big bracket right there on the frame. It doesn't move. The frame doesn't move either. It's double rail. Extra heavy duty. I actually had a pass I made with no head bolts in the motor and it ran it went 100 and it went about 130 mile an hour with no head bolts, 133 or something. So only holding the head down was the uh, the motor mount. This sits right on top of here, top of the rocker box. There it is right here. That goes there. This goes here. This goes right here, and then that goes through that, and it doesn't move. So. Like I said, after the run was over, these bolts here were just about completely out, and these other ones are out about three eighths of an inch. These were out like five eighths of an inch. I don't know how they, I don't know they didn't fall out. They were completely out of the motor. So at half track, it sounded like the intake manifold blew a hole in it, but that was where the air was. Every time it fired, it squirt some air out the side, but it still ran down the track. 
you never know how things work until you have problems. So anyway, basically the electric fuel pump sucks this dry and once it sucks all the oil out of it, it starts sucking air. It's a rotary vane pump. You ever run a vacuum pump on a race car? Or they're rotary vane pumps, they're old smog pumps. And the Holly fuel pump the same thing, just smaller. So this thing will actually suck. Like I said, after it sucks all the oil out, it sucks the air out. So it sucks a lot of air out. We also have the stock pump sucking oil out right here. Come out down here. It comes out of this hole right here. And it's so it's got double suction over there, and then we've got the big one over here just sucking everything out of it. So don't have a lot of oil built up my way. So the flywheels are free to spin and no oil, which is good. You don't want oil in your flywheels. <clears throat> so anyway, the cylinder has been highly modified too. It's been sleeved on purpose. So I kept breaking the spigots off the stock cylinders every pass. Sitting on my cylinder right there. So every pass I'd have a cylinder breaking. <coughs> with, <coughs> excuse me, was broken. So I, I took care of the problem. I made this, I made it only 50 thou tall instead of a couple hundred. And then I doubled the width on it. And it's made out of heat or this is a hardened cast iron material. It's not normal cast iron. These are hard. So that did that. I also don't use a head gasket. I use machining. These grooves right here, you can see right here. Every one of these grooves makes a full circle. It's an O-ring. Each groove is an O-ring. We got four O-rings at least on top of the cylinder. <coughs> so you see it right here. There's matching O-rings here. Here. Don't know if you can see them, but they're in there. So there's matching O-rings there. And then after you get into those O-rings, you get all these O-rings out here. There's more O-rings here. So between this head bolt here and here, there's another couple more O-rings in there. There's two or three in there. Now I ran a season and a half with just that much ceiling. That distance from there to there, that's all I had. This was all, this ring wasn't even in here for a year and a half. And I never had a problem. <coughs> It's all machined perfectly. I just put a squirt of aluminum paint on there to take up the small gap and call it done. This cylinder here has been broken for 10 years. Don't care the sleeve not. <clears throat> you can see how the sleeve now is wearing through here. It's leaking. It's not sealing anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. Same on this one. It had, a, it had the same cut discoloration here. It was over here too. So this ring now is not really working like it should. So now I'm out here on the secondary rings. And you can see there's a crack blowing right through there too, right where it's trying to seal. It's not even a good seal, it's, but it still doesn't leak. But it's probably going to start leaking in there. another couple years of racing it. So at some point I'll go back in here, I'll remachine this surface here, and then I'll remachine this surface and be good. I'll probably put a new sleeve in it. No reason to get rid of a good cylinder because it's cracked. But who knows, maybe I'll make another cylinder. You never know. So the last time I ran this motor, I seized a piston out in it, and I forget where I put that piston. If you look at my videos, I show it in my tribe and oil test, I show the piston was seized. So the, the cylinder had no indication of a, it had vertical marks going up and down, but no, you couldn't feel it. So I rehoned it, and I gave it a few passes with my core stone, and then I, and then I came by with my fine stone on top of that to, Try a different ring finish now. I'm experimenting on ring finish. So this one here is, it took all the marks out. But we do have something right here that happened here because it's heavily, it's got a big cut in it. Of course that's right up at the top of the rings are at. And I only have an inch and eighth of actual physical working space before the valves open. So that's taking away 25% of my ceiling area right there. And it's the worst 25, it's the very, very top of the cylinder, maximum cylinder pressure is. So that's blowing, got a lot of blow by right there. So, not good. So, but the cylinder stays pretty round and true. And like the tribonine kept the cylinder from being damaged. This piston here, even though it looks like it's seized here lightly, it's, you can't feel that. The tribonine kept it from getting any worse than that. Same on this one. So... The oil does its job. So, so what I'm doing on the cylinder finish is, is 
what they're doing now, they discovered is if you run a, a deeper valley in here for oil holding, so basically a coarser finish, then you run a plateau cut where you run a real smooth finish on that and that'll give you better longevity and more power. Because the rings are sealing better and they're lubricated so they don't wear the rings out. So you, you don't have metal on metal, you have rings on oil on metal. So I used to run a mirror finish in here and now I'm going to try a little bit different. The last time I ran this I did the same thing because I was having winning issues. So the next pass I had no oil issues, like on this piston here, there's no oil on the dome, even though it didn't look very good. <laughs> so and the other dome was half missing, it took an eighth inch off the dome over here, and it still looked fine. This is the piston I pulled out of the motor the night before I went to the race, because I was using so much oil. <clears throat> and it was just covered with oil, I was just drinking it, so I took it out, rehoned it coarser, put it back in. Put a different piston back in it because I didn't have time to deal with this one. And new rings ran it and melted half the dome off the damn thing and still went really fast. But the motor locked up before the finish line. Tore it apart, there was no damage in the motor. The piston was half melted. When I got back, I measured the piston. The piston was perfectly round and straight, just missing some of the dome. It got so hot it just locked up in the cylinder, but it didn't seize anything. So I took the rings off that piston, stuck them on this piston because these rings were broken in. And put it in another pass, and that's how I took it apart. But it didn't run very good. I had too much fuel in the motor. I was too lean on the first pass, too rich on the second pass. When you go too rich on nitro, it shuts the plug off and doesn't run. So anyway, so anyway, the plateau cut is is when you have a valley like this. When you hone your cylinders, you got a scratch. I think there's a peak up on here like this. So you have these double peaks right here. And you got a low spot. Now the coarser the grit, the deeper this valley is. The valley is what holds the oil to lubricate your rings and your piston too, but mainly the rings. So when your plateau cut is, you start with a coarse finish here, then you take a fine finish, run across the top, and you knock down the peaks. And then now your ring surface is wearing here and here, which is nice and smooth, so you got good dra low drag, but you have all this area here in this void for the oil holding capacity, and that's what lubricates your motor. So they have found out that that's how you do it nowadays. And so far, that has been working for me. So, And most of my customer jobs, I've been doing it this way for a while now, and it seems to be working pretty good. So the next thing is your crosshatch angle. So this is a fairly steep angle on this one. So steep angle is what you use on a long stroke motor because the piston speed is so fast going up and down. You need oil on the piston to keep it loose because it's moving so damn fast. Uh, like a jet bike motor with a high RPM motor but real short stroke, the piston speed really isn't that fast. And they run a flatter angle and that works better on those motors because it drinks too much oil if you have too coarse of too steep a valley. It's like a road. If you take a long windy road, it takes a while to get up a hill, but if you go straight up it goes fast. So but the straighter the road is, the more oil travel you're going to get. So there's a trade-off between how much oil you want and what you don't want. So evidently Harleys and Porsches love steep valve angles or steep crosshatch angles because they both have crappy oil control. But uh, when you get into uh, modern cars, they run a real low crosshatch angle because they're a high RPM application. So anyway, that's a lot of years of learning stuff and going to a lot of seminars and talking to other people that have been learning for 30 years themselves. So, so anyway, that's how that all works. So anyway, and then on my cams, these are red shift cams. So you take a stock cam, you, they grind a lobe off, you put a new lobe on it, and then you cut it and weld it and put it where you want it so you can change your valve timing in here. So I didn't like what they had, so I changed it to... Uh, about 10 years ago, and I picked up 500 RPM when I did that. Bike was always running flat until I did that. It must have liked what I did because it ran better. So once again, like I said, that's a stock lobe. This is a hot rod lobe. So the lobe is straighter up here. See how this one goes at an angle? See how this one goes more straight? So that's your duration down here. This actually has a little bit of a negative angle in here if you look at it. It's kind of hooked like that. And it's called uh, inverted flanking. So that's 
really high speed. That's on the closing side. The opening side, you got to be more gentle on it. And these don't have any of that kind of stuff. And then your lift is your total amount here. You see how the height of the lobe is your lift. So you can see how this has almost no lift to it, and I got a lot of lift. So that's the grind of the cam I was running. Anyway, it's a. Uh, can't read what it says, but. Was that 143 or something it says? I don't know. Anyway, they're supposed to be 281 and 282 degrees of duration at 50 thou lift, 53 lift, or Harley uses. And they were supposed to be 608 lift. So after I fixed my rocker arms and I actually degreed in my cams, I was getting 300 and 301 degrees of duration at 53 thou lift. And I was getting 675 thou lift opened up. So I'm not sure why the duration went way the hell up. But I think they were lying about how big these cams really were. So Anyway, on a 500cc motor, which is a 1000cc sports to short stroker, it's the power band is from 6 to 8250. And mainly it likes to be in above 65. There's nothing under 6. Might as well shut the ignition off. And then after I put the stroker kit in there, it dropped the power band about 500 RPM. Now, so, well, a little more, about 800 down. We're down to about 7,500 right now. It's kind of going to 76, 77, but it's not really happy up there. But so, so we'll call it. We went from eight down to six to 75. We lost 500 for sure, and I lost a couple hundred more. But we gained more torque downstairs because of the, the stroke. Just makes more stroke, makes more torque. So I have more torque than I used to have. Probably the horsepower is not any different, but the torque increase, so the bike goes should go a little faster. But right now it's not. I'm still trying to work out the fuel system for more nitro and not as much nitrous oxide. I do use both together. All right, so there's that one. These are my lifters. So they're holding up really, really well. So I run cast iron lifter blocks out of an early Sportster. I quit using cast iron blocks in the mid 60s for sure. And they're only used on the XL CH bike anyway. The XL bikes had the aluminum blocks in it. So only the CH bike had the cast iron block. And because it holds up better. And these are uh, Jim's lifters. It's the only ones I use because they, they seem to hold up. This has the big axle one in which I don't really like big axle stuff. So they're not repairable. But I guess I run out of small axle ones. So that's what I got now. These have been in there for years. They're still just fine. They look, they work, and I don't have any problems. And up on top here, I had to do some trickery on the. I got so much lift. These actually go all the way up into the block. They actually come up and hit the push rod cover. Right here. And I would get an oil leak. So I had to take the push rod cover and cut the lip down, the thickness of the O ring. So it doesn't stick through the O-ring, it's flush with it. These are the O-rings here. These are quad seals. And then I made a spacer and shimmed this all up so it doesn't hit the push rod cover anymore. And interruptions here. Hello. Hello. Yes. All right, what can I help 